It's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's webinar in our 2019 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This webinar is a part of a series that is brought to you in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and helps Allergy and Asthma Network move our mission forward to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions. We do that through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. My name is Kara Kraft, and I'm the Director of Research for the Network, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Dr. Tanya Laidlaw is joining us to talk about nasal polyps. We'll look at scientific information, as well as treatment and management issues. Dr. Tanya Laidlaw completed her medical degree at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, her residency in pediatrics at Massachusetts General Hospital, and then entered an allergy immunology fellowship at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She performed her research training in the laboratory of Dr. Joshua A. Boyce, where she focused on the pathogenesis of asthma and aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, or AERD, and the pro-inflammatory role of the platelet and specific lipids in this disorder. She joined the faculty in 2009 and is now an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and is the director of translational research in allergy and director of the AERD Center at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Her research continues to be focused on understanding AERD and nasal polyposis. And she is dedicated to investigating the causative mechanisms and exploring new treatments for these diseases. Her group at the Brigham and Women's Hospital's AERD Center follows over a thousand patients with AERD and nasal polyps and has several ongoing research studies that are rec recruiting and enrolling patients today. Dr. Laidlaw, it is our honor and pleasure. Welcome to the webinar, and we are so excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. So I've been asked to speak about nasal polyps, and I'm gonna to try to make sure that I hit both some clinically relevant points and a bit of science in there as well as well as give some hints about what's coming both in terms of research and perhaps, hopefully, in terms of upcoming treatments. I do have some disclosures. I am a consultant to several companies who make medications that may be used to treat nasal polyposis. And overall, our objectives here are really to talk about treatments for patients with nasal polyps, which ones may be available and may be most appropriate, and how to be able to then use this information to improve the clinical ability to understand appropriate treatments and prescribe appropriate medications for our patients. Overall, I think of this talk as kind of very generally, what is CRS with NP? And so CRS with NP is a phrase I'll use. It stands for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's quite a mouthful. So CRS with NP comes up quite frequently. I will talk about the current treatment guidelines and the very loose suggestions that are out there to help guide physicians into how best to treat these patients. And I'll also point out where and how obviously those treatment guidelines are currently failing us, both in terms of a generalized failure to follow the guidelines at all, but also just where we kind of run out of enough information so that we just don't have appropriate treatments for many of our patients. And we're then going to run through six different treatments, um, two different versions of uh, studies about steroids, which are a mainstay of therapy, um, talk a bit about surgery, as this is also a mainstay of therapy for nasal polyposis, and then I'm going to talk about three general categories of biologic medications and the data that's out there about them. So rhino sinusitis, rhino really meaning the nose, sinuses meaning the cavities behind the nose and eyes, um, can happen with or without nasal polyps. So classic rhinitis is a runny nose that you would get, for example, with just uh, seasonal allergy symptoms. Rhino sinusitis is something that you might get when you get a bad cold and also have some sinuses fill up. 
And then with nasal polyps is what we're going to talk about today. So the sort of generic explanation and definition of this is you end up with inflammation around the cavity of the nose and sinuses. We call it acute if it lasts for less than four weeks. So just about all of our viral upper respiratory infections last less than four weeks, and most bacterial sinus infections last less than four weeks as well. Those tend to be infectious and self-limiting and are not the subject of today's talk. Really, we're talking about chronic rhinosinusitis. So these are symptoms that have been going on for more than 12 weeks, so months of symptoms. And it's on the background of this inflammation, chronic rhinosinusitis inflammation, that patients can develop nasal polyps. So I have two rhinoscopy photographs. On the left, you see a patient who has swollen pink areas in the inside of their nose and, and sinuses um, and some sort of white pussiness there that may very well be either a bacterial or a viral infection. And then to the right of it is a similar looking photograph, but you'll notice in the center is sort of a glistening yellowish clear kind of substance. That is a nasal polyp coming down out of the sinuses and into the nose. And on the far right, on the petri dish in the white background, is actually one polyp that's been removed from a patient of mine. Um, and you'll notice that this is an inch ruler below it. And so this is a polyp that was about an inch and a half to two inches wide that came out of this woman's nose. And this was only one of many. So that's what it looks like on rhinoscopy when you see just one. On the right is what it looks like when you take one of them out. And you can imagine having these polyps fill up both of your nostrils and all of your sinus cavities so that on a CAT scan, where we would normally expect sinuses to be full of air pockets, instead we see these densely packed nasal polyps taking up the entire sinus cavity. So in terms of what we see with this disease, um, on, on the left, we, I'm going to introduce a concept called type 2 inflammation, which is a somewhat generic description of what can be allergic inflammation or innate immunity inflammation, um, can involve antibodies but doesn't have to, can involve allergy but doesn't have to, and doesn't actually have an entirely known cause. So the classic things that happen with this kind of inflammation can be lots of immune cells coming into the nose, and in this case, into the polyps. We're going to talk about eosinophils a bit and mast cells, two immune cells that tend to come in during this disease. Um, you end up with IgE, the IgE antibody being produced. That's also the antibody that is the cause of most of our allergic symptoms. So that if you're allergic to birch pollen, for example, in New England in this season, you will have IgE to birch pollen and will often have lots of IgE within your nasal tissue. And this can then lead to mucus production. And we then see this on the right side. Our patients will complain of nasal blockage, loss of smell, and a mucus production from the sinuses then comes out and becomes a wet, sticky discharge and snot coming out of our nose. So somewhere around 3% of the general population might have CRS with nasal polyps, depending on where in the world you are. So this is in the US, which has slightly higher um, prevalence than, for example, in parts of Asia. It's much more common in patients who have asthma. Um, and in patients who have chronic rhinosinusitis in the US, about 20% of those patients also have nasal polyposis. So this is actually a relatively common thing that we see. So in terms of a little bit of epidemiology and the patients who come to us, so in general, overall, in terms of the, the um, uh, prevalence of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, it's a little bit more common in men. But if you look overall in terms of gender differences, it actually appears as though women have slightly more severe recalcitrant disease, and specifically AERD, which is the triad of nasal polyposis along with asthma and reactions to aspirin and other NSAIDs is more common in women with about a 60 to 65 percent prevalence in women. So more than half of the patients who have nasal polyps are also sensitized to an environmental allergen. But you notice I'm writing sensitized to environmental allergen. I'm not actually writing allergic to environmental allergens. And the two things actually I think are importantly different. When we talk about sensitization, we mean as allergists or as immunologists that you have an IgE antibody to the allergen. So in general, it means that either I've done a skin test or I've done um, a blood draw, and I've asked specifically to see if you have IgE to any number of environmental causes, birch pollen, cats, dogs, dust mites, molds, etc. 
That means if I find the IgE antibody to one of those allergens, you have a sensitivity to it. It does not 100% correlate, however, that it means that if you come in contact with that thing, that you will have an allergic reaction to it. We certainly have patients who skin test positive to dogs, to cats, to dust, to pollen, and say, that's fine that the test shows that, but I don't necessarily see any of those symptoms when I'm around my neighbor's cat or my son's dog or in the seasonal changes with pollen. So we don't actually know what percentage of these patients truly develop allergic reactions to this, but we know that many of them do have IgE2 allergen. There are also other comorbid diseases that tend to coexist with these patients. So the patients are more likely to have true allergic rhinitis and allergic runny noses, um, chronic runny nose, asthma for sure, I already mentioned, GERD, which is reflux disease, gastrointestinal, and also sleep apnea. So somewhere around, it's estimated, 40% of all patients with chronic rhinocytositis and nasal polyps also have some element of sleep apnea. This is something that hasn't been particularly well studied. And one of the problems with this is that the main stay of pulmonary treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is CPAP. CPAP really works best when there is an open nasal passage to help push air through. Unfortunately, our patients are often so blocked up with their congestion from the sinusitis and their blockade from the nasal polyps that the treatment of CPAP simply does not work for them and they end up with untreated sleep apnea. So about a quarter to a half of patients have asthma as well. And I'll talk a bit more about the cells in coming slides. Um, eosinophilic polyps, so eosinophils being a common um, immune cell, are much more common in the US and in Western Europe. So the vast majority of all the polyps that I see here in New England are eosinophilic, which means that when the surgeon takes them out, sends them to the pathologist, the pathologist looks and see, sees many eosinophils scattered throughout the polyp. Much less so in other countries, and truthfully, there hasn't been a ton studied in parts of Central Africa or South America, but we do know that in Asia, um, in especially in, um, mainland areas of Korea, Thailand, and some of mainland China, there, the exact kind of the polyp is slightly different. So this is a recommended practice for the treatment of CRS with NP. So the treatment sort of starts at the top, and I'll go through what each acronym means. So recommendation to begin with in green is saline irrigation, so either saltwater sprays or saltwater rinses. And then INCS is intranasal corticosteroid spray or drops. In the US, many of these are available over the counter under the brand names of Flonase and Nasacorp, but there are lots of uh, generics as well. And then OCS stands for oral corticosteroids, one short course it says. So it recommends that if the, just the salt water and the nasal sprays aren't enough, you can try a single course of something that's often used like a five-day course of prednisone or a medrol dose pack to see if that will recede the problem. If that doesn't work, you go to the next line. So then we have these sort of optional as they're listed, meaning that frankly, we're not even sure that they work particularly well. Macrolides and doxycycline are both um, antibiotics, which are used maybe to help treat potential infections, but also because of some anti-inflammatory properties. We might want to do a little bit of an immune evaluation just to make sure that you don't have an immunodeficiency and you're getting chronic infections. And then medications like anti leukotrienes things like Montelukast or Zyluton, which really haven't been particularly well studied in large studies for nasal polyposis. Nonetheless, they're on the treatment guidelines. Things that are not particularly widely recommended. So lots of antibiotics, unless there's an obvious cultured infection. Certainly not IV antibiotics used very often. Antifungals, unless we know you have a fungal infection in your nose. Um, and aspirin desensitization for patients with AERD. It breaks my heart that technically the treatment um, regimen does not widely recommend this, but that is a very specific treatment that we're not going to go into today. That's a very specific for only patients who have the aspirin and NSAID sensitivity. Then they threw in a few unusual things, things like surfactants and honey that people were squirting up their nose, for which there really is no evidence that it's safe or efficacious. So this is all we have on the treatment guidelines right now from 2016. So if that works, great. You go up and you continue to use that. If it doesn't work, then the next step it suggests after medical management is you refer them to an endoscopic sinus surgeon, perhaps to do surgery and continue medical management. So this is already insufficient in terms of guidelines and options for treating physicians. And frankly, we don't even follow this particularly well. 
this is what actually happens. So yes, first we do lots of saline irrigation. That's pretty common. Some folks will add in baby shampoo. There's some evidence that a few drops of baby shampoo will help to decrease the likelihood that you will carry bacteria in your nose. Then all kinds of, uh, uh, number two is all kinds of steroids. So all kinds of intranasal steroid sprays, drops, um, directly instilled budesonide respules, which are actually not FDA approved for nasal polyps, but are used um, off label. Um, instead of putting them in a nebulizer for asthma, we put them directly into the nose. There are ways you can get budesonide compounded by a specialty pharmacy, or Xhance, which is a newly developed device that helps to spray powdered um, steroid up the nose. If that isn't enough, you can try antileukotrienes. If that is enough, allergens, allergists will usually do some allergy testing, and if they find positivities, we'll suggest allergen immunotherapy. If that doesn't work, then we end up using a ton of oral steroids. And the truth is, even though the guidelines said in parentheses, one short course, anyone with CRS with nasal polyps will know that multiple allergists and ENT surgeons have re-prescribed over and over oral steroids. And a lot of what we do is actually desperately trying to find steroid sparing medications. We also do end up prescribing oral antibiotics. I try to avoid it in my own practice, but certainly there are folks out there who have been on course after course of oral antibiotic, just hoping that there's an infection up there they'll be able to treat. So again, we tried these medical things. If it works, great, continue with medical treatment. If it doesn't, we refer to ENT and they'll often do a sinus CAT scan to see further into the, into the sinus cavities. Often that ends up leading to sinus surgery because they failed all of the available medical options. But the problem is, what happens when surgery doesn't work, right? What happens when either after the surgery, the patient does not get symptomatic relief, or the symptomatic relief they get from surgery is short-lived and the polyps will recur, which does happen. So then we end up bringing the patient into this process. So what are the patient preferences? It certainly depends. It depends geographically. It depends on their own insurance. It depends on their own uh, experiences. Unfortunately for us, insurance coverage does dictate much of the care that we're able to give, depending on what medications we can get covered. And it does dictate referral options, right? There may or may not be ENTs in your area that we're allowed to refer to. Um, and then we have patients telling us, you know, my ENT I keep going back to, and he or she just wants to do surgery again. I keep going back to my allergist, but he or she just wants to prescribe me prednisone. And there's a generalized frustration with our patients. And I find as an allergist that uh, I feel as though there's an overuse of allergy shots and allergy immunotherapy as a treatment for nasal polyps. Um, and I don't know completely if this is because patients go to an allergist asking for allergy shots or because allergists just enjoy giving them because it's something we know how to do. But even though our patients are often sensitized to allergen, it does not necessarily mean that that allergen drives all of their nasal polyposis. So we're going to start launching into the treatment options that are currently available and some of the data behind them. So there, number one and number two are both studies and talking about how we get steroids into the nose. So intranasal corticosteroids is a standard of care therapy for CRS, but how is the best way to get it? So we're going to talk about studies that looked at sort of large volume saline getting in there, excuse me, large volume of steroid versus just the saline sprays, the saline irrigation. We're comparing large volume steroid washes with an actual nasal steroid spray versus this new funkier steroid delivery system that we know by the brand name of Xhance. So this is a study that compared whether or not just saline saltwater sinus rinses were any better or worse than the same saline sinus rinse, but instead now adding budesonide steroid to it. So this um, study took 80 patients. These were all patients with CRS. Not everyone had nasal polyps, though some did. And they did a DBPC, so double blind, placebo controlled. So this means that neither the patients nor the doctors knew what they were getting and many of them got placebo, and many of them got the actual drug. And they did this daily for a month. And the thing they were looking for was, does using budesonide compared to saline com change whether or not our patients record their symptoms differently? So the test called a SNOT-22, I'm sure very intentionally named, stands for Sinonasal Outcome Test. There are 22 questions that patients are asked, and it's a zero, no symptoms, through five worst possible symptoms. And it's everything from very specific sinus symptoms, need to blow nose, sneezing, congestion, uh, lack of sense of smell, 
two things that are more quality of life in terms of you know how embarrassed, how irritable, and how well you're sleeping. So if we look at um, wh what n percentage of patients on each treatment, the budesonide on the left or the saline on the right, what percentage of them were actually able to improve their SNOT22 by at least nine points? And nine points is the minimum change that we look for to say that, yes, this change was really real. So in the patients on the right who had saline, only 59% of them, so slightly more than half, improved on with the light blue over nine points. Now, I'll tell you, 59% placebo response is not quite a placebo response, right? This is 59% of patients responding to really careful saline washes, which means that at the very least, all of our patients should be on daily saline washes. It helps to move the bacteria through, move any viruses through, move allergen through, and thin out the mucus that patients can then blow it out. But on the left, there was notable increased improvement in patients who added the extra steroid budesonide. So 79% of patients got benefit from the budesonide, whereas only 59% got benefit from the saline. On the right, they then divided out those patients into those who did or did not have polyps. And the answer was, regardless of whether or not you had polyps, this budesonide worked slightly better than saline. So they concluded that adding in a milligram of budesonide did improve both the subjective and the objective measures of chronic rhinocytositis. And whether or not you had polyps, you still got benefit. So then comparing corticosteroid nasal irrigations, same thing, we're now putting the, um, the liquid into the rinse bottle versus a spray. Now, this was cleverly done because either the placebo or the, or the steroid spray um, was in the same bottle versus a placebo saline rinse versus steroid rinse in the um, squeeze bottle. And this is a slightly smaller study, so 20-something patients in each side. But this was done a little differently. So this study started the day after their surgery. So for a full year, every day, they used either nothing, or sorry, placebo, or rinse, um, with or without steroid. Now, these are very messy slides, with the yellow being the nasal irrigation and the blue being the spray. At the end of the day, the conclusion was that they both did something, the steroid in the spray or the steroid in the irrigation, but the steroid in the, in the irrigation was more successful than the steroid in the spray, both of which were more successful than just saline or placebo alone. So looking now on um, sinus CAT scan and endoscopy. So this is a surgical study. So on the left, we're looking at a sinus CAT scan. And if the patients right after surgery were put only on the nasal spray compared to on the nasal irrigation, which gets much more stirred up into their nose, um, the, how inflamed their, their mucus was, if you will, their, their, the mucosal linings of their sinuses um, was being compared on sinus CAT scan and the irrigation fluid was better than the spray. And the opposite flip side on the right, this is now patients getting endoscopy with their sinus surgeon um, and looking up to see the score of how bad their inflammation was. And the nasal spray allowed for worse inflammation than the nasal irrigation, which is a little lower. So similar conclusion, looking at different outcomes, both the spray and the irrigation improved the symptoms after surgery, but the irrigation was better than just the spray. All right, so now we get into the next system, which is a newly devised device by which you use your own expired breath force to force um, fluticasone up into the nose. So EDSFLU stands for exhalation delivery system with fluticasone. And because you're, it is your own exhalation that gets it up there, really it's the force of your blow that simply forces the fluticasone powder further back into the nose. At the top, you see on the right, the intranasal spray really just gets the steroid deposit into the front of the nose, whereas this exhalation delivery system gets it all the way up into the back of the sinuses. They've designed it well enough that you're, you're not actually blowing your own breath up into the nose. It's just the force of your breath, but it helps it to get back quite a bit further. So this big study for this nasal polyposis, um, also double-blind placebo control, and these patients all had severe, moderate to severe congestion and also all had nasal polyps on both sides. And the endpoints, the changes they were looking for, 
or to see whether or not the patients reported improvement in their morning congestion. And that's sort of the, the subjective um, report for the patient symptoms. And then objectively, they had surgeons do rhinoscopy, look up their nose with a camera, and grade the severity of their polyp on each size on each side after um, up to week 16. On the right were a whole bunch of other endpoints in this larger study, looking at everything from the SNOT-22 to other quality of life syndrome um, indexes and the amount of flow that they're able to get in as their nose with the peak nasal flow. So on the top left, this is looking at the main difference in nasal polyp score. And at that week 16, where the light blue box begins, we see that the placebo in blue is notably worse than the um, drug delivery really at any of the doses that they tried. And on the two right, both congestion reported by patient and sense of smell as reported by patient, there really is a remarkable improvement in the patient's symptoms if they're on any of the doses of the exhaled delivery system with the fluticasm. So all of these were again um, against placebo. So they found that 28% of patients, about a quarter of the patients, actually had the, the polyps go away within at least um, one nostril. And for the most part, patients felt as though it was well tolerated and didn't have too much irritation, although it does seem to cause occasional bloody noses and some irritation along the nasal septum as well. So moving out of the steroid arena, and moving into surgery, which is a, also commonly recommended when our medical therapies fail. Um, so we know that to some extent nasal polyps recur after surgery, but we don't know how often. We know that AERD certainly is associated with a faster recurrence, frustratingly for our patients. And having eosinophils, eosinophils in your blood, those cells in your blood can also be associated with recurrence. But we really don't know the recurrence rate of nasal polyps. So this study in 2017 hoped to solve that mystery for us. They looked at um, patients, all of whom had a chronic rhinocytositis with nasal polyps, and they wanted to learn the recurrence rates and were there any factors that they could see that clearly associate with recurrence. A number of their patients did have AARD, a lot of their patients had asthma or allergies, and more than half of them had already had prior sinus surgery. So. In the gray alone, we're looking at the percent of patients who had polyps. And so a total of 63 patients, 100% of them started out with polyps when they began preoperatively. Six months later, after all the polyps had already been removed, 35% of them had polyps that had returned. 12 months later, 45% of them did. And 18 months later, 40% of them still had polyps that returned. Which means that in terms of the polyp regrowth, about 40% of patients will have their polyps back within 12 months. It doesn't mean that they were as large as they were before surgery, but it means that they were visible on rhinoscopy. So although helpful for a period of time for many patients, this is not a particularly long-term solution. So what predicted recurrence? So not shockingly, perhaps, if you had had a previous sinus surgery, you are more likely to have your polyps recur. That's a little bit of a confounder, since if by definition you're already at your second surgery now for the study and you've had a previous one, we know your polyps have already recurred. Um, and also, the worse your polyps were to begin with, sort of higher the score was, the more likely that they were going to come back. So polyp recurrence is common, just teaching us again that we're not done. We need better treatment strategies. So I'm going to go into a little bit of nerdy science here for the inflammation so that we can then introduce the next set of medications, the biologics. So on the left, we have a nose and we have an epithelial layer. So that's sort of a skin layer that covers your entire nose and all of your sinuses. We have cells, immune cells in there that make three relatively famous cytokines now, IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5. And each one, blue is for IL-4, yellow is for IL-13, red is for IL-5, then goes forward, up, down, and to the right to cause problems. So, for example, IL-5 is well known for activating eosinophils and for causing eosinophils to traffic into the tissues. Um, IL-4 and IL-13 can help induce B cells to produce IgE. They can also produce lots of mucus. It's really the reason that we have runny noses and thick mucus is because of IL-4 and IL-13. And you end up with barrier disruptions, that epithelial layer that is supposed to form a barrier between the outside 
and through your nose ends up being disrupted and allowing further risk factors, viruses, allergen, environmental stuff to be able to get into the nose because that barrier is now disrupted. On the top, we end up with the B cells producing IgE, and that IgE can then affect both basophils and mast cells to both cause um, acute allergic reactions, but also the chronic production of things that cause inflammation, including things like leukotrienes. So we now have a variety of biologics that are at least attempting to target some of these pathways to see if we can actually modulate the inflammation by blocking one or more of these pathways. So omalizumab, which is the one we've had around for the longest, is anti-IgE. So it doesn't block the production of IgE, but it blocks the ability of the IgE to then bind onto the basophil or the mast cell, and it helps to calm down basophils and mast cells, both for allergic reaction reasons, but also just for the chronic production of things like leukotrienes and the other mediators that mast cells pr produce. So although omalizumab is to some extent an anti-allergy medication, it's really anti-IgE and anti-mast cell, and so there are a lot of downstream anti-inflammatory properties of omalizumab as well. So we now have three medications, mepolizumab, rezizumab, and benrolizumab, that are all in one form or another, either blocking the IL-5 or the IL-5 receptor to decrease eosinophil activation and lots of the other um, activities of IL-5. And then dupilumab um, blocks both the receptor that is required for both IL-4 and IL-13 to signal and therefore can inhibit the pathway to the right of that one. So I'll go through each of these. Um, I won't spend much time on this, but this polyp scoring system um, is often used by ENT surgeons to look at their patients and follow them chronologically, but has also now been used by a lot of clinical trials to get a generally accepted way to measure the size of polyps um, on rhinoscopy. And then we have something called a VAS, a visual analog scale, where patients will report their symptoms of runny nose, mucus, blockade, and sense of smell. So here, we're starting with omalizumab again, and this was an early study done, published in 2013, that with 24 patients, two-thirds of whom went on omalizumab, one-third on placebo, we noticed that after 16 weeks, after four months, there really was a dramatic change in that nasal polyp score. So again, everyone started up here at the zero line, and then we were down to sort of two and a half points of the nasal polyp score um, decreased, with the first real reduction noticed already by two months and maintained out. Um, for 16 weeks. And there were a fair number of symptoms that were measured here as well. So patients reported less nasal congestion really quite quickly. They reported some improvement in sense of smell, although not incredibly impressive in this particular small study, and a really notable reduction in rhinorrhea. So that was helpful. Actually, I think I have those two things back. I think rhinorrhea is in the middle. Um, so the, the rhinorrhea didn't change as much and the sense of smell did. Um, this is another study that actually compared the effects of omalizumab to surgery, which is an accepted uh, you know, care for patients with NP as well. And so here we have patients on the left um, where half of them um, ended up, about half ended up getting omalizumab and about half ended up getting surgery. And they started off with equivalent SNOT22 scores. The omalizumab patients were at about 52 out of a total of 110. Um, the pre-surgery about 70. But you know, anywhere above about 15 or 20 is considered to be abnormal. And then on the right, when we look at the SNOT22s at week 16, we see that they both improved quite a bit, in fact, essentially equivalently. So if you were put on omalizumab for your nasal polyps or you were given surgery, there really is a dramatic reduction in the SNOT22 score and in the quality of life score. Um, and if we break it out um, into the time points, already in the bottom left, in just four weeks, there's a reduction um, for most patients in the SNOT22 score in patients who are given omalizumab, which is maintained and further reduced by week six. Um, and in the before and after SNOT22 for surgery, we see a sort of similar reduction. So this is certainly an option and is under uh, further investigation now. So that was a small phase two study that I showed you um, in addition to the SNOT22 improvement in a different study compared to surgery, with the improvements really noticing, noticed first between weeks four and week eight and certainly continuing on through week 16. It's currently approved for moderate to severe allergic asthma, and many of those patients also have CRS with NP, or vice versa. Many of the patients with nasal polyps also have allergic asthma. So we have been able to try out omalizumab for our patients who have both allergic asthma and CRS with NP. 
The company noticed that this drug seemed to be working for those patients, and the phase two was quite encouraging. And so phase three nasal polyp studies have now completed, for the most part, their recruitment with some very early high um, uh, data released showing that their primary endpoints were met and some of the key secondary endpoints were met as well. So there's certainly, certainly much more information yet to come about that medication. But ideally, this will become another medication in our toolkit for patients with not only asthma, but also with um, nasal polyposis. So the next group um, are the anti-IL-5 medications. And here we're looking at, again, a small phase two trial. Um, these are patients who had nasal polyps on both sides, and they used an IV form of nepolizumab. Um, and again, sort of similar study, study setup. Um, we're looking now for a decrease in the polyp size at the, um, on the left, with the placebo in black, very little placebo response, and a notable sort of two or so point reduction on nepolizumab. They, uh, this study um, also looked at SNOT22 on the right with a reduction, so we, we ended up with a, about an average of 40 for placebo and 25 for epilizumab, about a 15-point difference between the two. Again, not a huge difference, but there is an improvement there in SNOT22 and quality of life. In the middle is the percentage of patients who sort of qualified for nasal polyp surgery. And so if everyone was bad enough when they started the study to qualify for surgery, instead of getting surgery, they either went on placebo or mepilizumab for this study. At the end of the study, about 90% of the placebo patients still um, um, qualified for surgery, and about 70% of the patients with mepolizumab still qualified. So again, a slight improvement in the requirement for surgery in the mepolizumab versus placebo group. So it reduced the portion of patients who met criteria for surgery. Um, it did improve the nasal polyp score in some of these quality of life and SNOT22 scores. Improvement started, by, again, by about the second or third month. Um, it's currently approved for severe eosinophilic asthma. So we've also been able to use this for some of our patients with nasal polyps and asthma. The phase three nasal polyp studies are a little bit behind the omelizumab. The recruitment has completed, but we don't have any data for them yet. And one of the other medications, benralizumab in the same class, anti-IL-5 receptor, also approved for severe eosinophilic asthma also being studied in CRS with MP, even yet a bit more behind than the mepolizumab, but hopefully in the next few months to the next year, we'll get more information from these studies to understand their utility for our patients. So the final medication I'm gonna talk about is dupilumab. So this is anti-IL-4 receptor alpha, which is a receptor that's required for IL-4 and IL-13 to signal and cause um, the mucus production and the barrier uh, disruption and the IgE production. So this is on the left, again, similar kind of thing. We're looking at the nasal polyp score. In blue are the patients who are on dupilumab. In gray are the patients who are on placebo. And they noticed, again, about a two-point reduction in the nasal polyp score, similar to what we saw in the smaller studies of mepolizumab and the smaller studies of omelizumab. This is in the larger phase three study. And in the right, we see that over a time course. So we, um, the first time point they looked at was at two months. That you know that reduction was already there with the one and a half point reduction, two to 2.5 points down by week 16 and week 24. The patients then came off of treatment in this particular study to see how quickly it would last. And I suppose it depends if you're looking at it as a glass half full or glass half empty. Glass half full is that you know week 36 it was still a difference, so there was still some improvement already between week four that, that was maintained between week 24 and week 36. Glass half empty says that eventually it looks like it comes back to where it had been before with the polyp growth, and so we don't really think that this is going to end up being a cure, but still a treatment. Uh, Dupilumab um, has completed their phase three trials and has analyzed most of their data with the publications um, almost out there for the public to, to see. These have been presented at um, a couple of different conferences, and the FDA is currently um, on the docket to look at Dupilumab for hopefully approval in treatment in nasal polyposis. Um, diving a little bit more into studies because we have more from this data with the larger phase three study, that lund mackay score CAT scan score is a measure to some extent of the extent of polyposis and sinusitis within the sinuses that the CAT scan can see. Again, dramatic reduction on dupilumab. Upset 
actually stands for a smell identification test. And this is my favorite one. So this is actually booklets of 40 scratch and stiff stickers where patients are asked to scratch and then smell and then choose from A through D which they think which things they think that they're smelling. Um, and this was really an improvement of around 10 items. And so patients started around being able to smell only 15 out of 40 and got up into the 25 to 30 out of 40 range when they were on dupilumab, which really brings them back into the nearly completely normal sense of smell uh, range. And this is something that a lot of our patients have a very difficult time with. And so the improvement in smell, I think, for our patients will end up being something that they think is very important for them. And I know that all of the studies have looked at this to some extent. So this is looking at that sense of smell a bit more um, detailed. Um, they um, did this at two weeks for the first time. And so there was already just at two weeks an improvement of six, an average, of six more things that could be smelled out of the group of 40. We were up to eight uh, to nine more things at week four. 16, 24 continued to improve and stayed for the full year. So these patients who, who returned their sense of smell were able to maintain that for the year. The SNOT-22, which is that quality of life score, some specific to the nose, some just quality of life, also did seem to improve already by week four, certainly kind of maxed out its improvement by week 16 or 24, and was maintained um, through week 52 as long as patients um, stayed on the drug. And this is an injection that's given every two weeks with these time points measured every one, mo uh, one month or every couple of months. So in conclusion for dupilumab, it did improve the nasal polyp score, the sinus CAT scan scores, um, the symptoms of rhinosinusitis, sinusitis, patient's sense of smell for sure, and the health-related quality of life and SNOT-22 scores. Other things they looked at, it reduced the number of patients who needed to um, use systemic steroids like prednisone. It reduced the portion of patients who needed to go for surgery. Now, in this study, uh, more than half the patients also had asthma. And about a third of the patients had AERD, and the presence of AERD didn't actually affect the results. So it was on average as good and no different an improvement if you did or did not have AERD. So dupilumab is currently approved for moderate to severe asthma with an eosinophilic phenotype, or whether or not you have eosinophils if you are oral steroid-dependent severe asthmatic. Um, many of these patients also have CRS with NP, and so this is um, the study that sort of started and ended the earliest. We have the most data for it, and they're a little bit ahead of the game, and they're the most likely to become FDA-approved for nasal polyp treatment within the next couple of months. So in terms of what we've gone through today, we talked about how we as physicians define CRS with NP, both in terms of symptoms and the epidemiology. I went through some options for current treatment guidelines, and you saw where the holes were and how when our already rather paltry medical um, management fails, the next option is surgery. And when surgery fails, we don't have a next option. So I talked a little bit about the options that we have and why many of us would prefer sinus irrigations over a plain sinus spray or a sinus spray over just a saline irrigation, but how even a saline irrigation on its own is certainly better than nothing. I talked a bit about surgery and the pros and cons there, and also some of the biologics that are either available for us now or coming down the pipeline. So I think we've left time for another 10 or 12 minutes for questions. And if there are any, I am more than happy to take any questions that folks might have. Dr. Laidlaw, thank you so, so very much for this impactful overview of nasal polyps. So we do have um, a lot of questions actually, and we will do our very best to get to um, as many as we can. Uh, the first question, uh, is from someone who's asking, I'm currently taking five drugs, aspirin, Zyflo, Singular, Simbacort, and do budesonide saline rinses. This feels like way too many drugs just to manage this frustrating disease. Please tell me there's a better approach on the horizon. My allergist has told me that Dupixent will be approved within the next year for nasal polyps. Is this the same timeline you've heard? Excellent. So I'm taking a wild guess from the list of medications that that patient um, has AERD in addition to having the asthma and the nasal polyposis. And I would agree that five medications is a lot. 
So a lot of what we do is try to go for risk-benefit ratio. So I would say that if the patient is on those five medications and feels as though this is working brilliantly for them and they're happy with that treatment, there isn't necessarily a need to change any of those drugs. There isn't anything that I think is horrible on that list. That being said, several of those medications do have side effects or potential side effects. So certainly Zyflo um, can cause some side effects. Liver enzymes need to be checked. It's also very expensive. Um, aspirin is very inexpensive but can cause some gastritis or long-term bruising or bleeding effects. Um, and the budesonide washes, what I did not mention is that we do expect that there is some systemic absorption of budesonide. So I think it's certainly better than needing to use IV or oral steroids all the time. But it's not a 0% side effect rate for the budesonide. So the next medication, I agree with the allergist that we likely have coming down the pipeline here is Dupixent, which is a brand name of Dupilumab. Um, the FDA should be reviewing it this month and next. Theoretically, we will hear in July, actually, about its approval. They claim it will happen relatively quickly. Um, how quickly insurance companies are able to adopt that, I don't know for sure. I will tell you that I am planning to try to prescribe Dupixent to some nasopol patients by the end of July, and I already have paperwork prepared to slam back at the insurance companies when they try to object and tell me that it's not yet covered. Um, and hopefully being able to um, have not only the FDA approval, but also some published data out there will be enough to convince insurance companies to pay for it. And I think that would be a very appropriate alternative to begin and to then, if we get better improvement for this patient symptomatically, to slowly start peeling away one of those five medications or two of those five medications. Thank you um, so much. Our next question is cause or coincidence? I have six polyps that were discovered several months after I switched my nebulizer from a mouth device to a mask so I could breathe through my nose. Could this have caused it? They were taking I, chromalin and were the medication. Okay. Yep. Um, so the the... Short answer is no. I don't think that it caused it. Um, the longer answer is that the frustrating piece of this is that we don't actually know what causes polyps. And so that gets at the root of this. So I can't actually say, no, that didn't cause it. And let me explain to you what did cause it. I can say, no, that didn't cause it because there's no immunologic mechanism by which you know, the shifting the mechanism of the inhalation of chromalin or of budesonide or of saline um, into the nose or into the mouth would cause enough irritation to explain um, polyp growth. Um, but I really don't have then a, a good satisfying alternative explanation of what ended up causing the polyps. Many of us have our own theories, but they are really just theories. Um, my current theory is that um, a lot of the nasal polyp growth is actually caused by a body's overreaction to a viral illness. And so there may have been a time in the distant past when our patients got what otherwise seemed like a very common cold, upper respiratory infection, and that your body appropriately cleared the cold and moved on. And yet somehow the body continually kind of wakes up every morning thinking that it needs to keep fighting that cold. And in doing so, produces mucus, produces um, you know, mucosal swelling, it ends up producing polyps in a chronic sense. Um, but there's no known cause that we can either avoid or prevent going forward. And no, I don't think it was probably caused by the nebulizer. So the next question, is you showed a slide um, talking about EDS FLU. Is this available now for patients? Yes, so this is a device that was approved by the FDA for nasal polyposis, and the device uses the fluticasone powder that you end up blowing up your nose. It is available under the brand name called Xhance, X-H-A-N-C-E. Um, it is depending on the state that you're living in and the payer um, mix within that state. It is either very affordable or very unaffordable, um, depending on how that has worked. And the company can help with giving, um, uh, I think, some financial help for the more expensive ones. Um, and it is just an, another way to get topical steroids into the nose and sinuses. Um, and it's probably slightly better than a regular old over-the-counter spray mechanism. So your next question is, how do you and physicians determine which biologic to use? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, that is probably a webinar in and of itself. Um, 
So I'll, uh, there, are, there are two answers. One is not at all satisfying, so I'll start with that one. And the second one is, is I think, really what we're getting at. So the not satisfying one is, at this point, we take what we can get. In other words, um, the FDA has certain requirements. They have to fit into a certain category you know, for omelizumab at the moment. For a it's only approved for asthma or for chronic urticaria. For asthma, you have to have requirements of a certain IgE level or a certain skin test reactivity. So if you meet those requirements and you have you know, allergic symptoms, then that's a good option. If you don't meet those requirements, I can't use it. Um, the anti-IL-5 agents all require some kind of eosinophils um, level in the blood, so we have to make sure we can check for that. And dupelumab, at least for right now, before it becomes approved for nasal polyps, also requires eosinophils um, to be noted, unless they're on chronic steroids. So um, for the asthma phenotype, which is really what we're treating in the hopes of then also treating nasal polyps on the side if we're able to, um, we are stuck with what we're allowed to use it for, depending on what the early studies showed and the FDA has approved. Um, we now have enough experience that many of us kind of can give a gestalt, which is also not a satisfying answer, of saying that if you're the kind of patient who presents with a set of symptoms X, Y, and Z, I've had 10 other patients with X, Y, and Z, and they all did or did not do well in a certain biologic. We tend to pick that one over others. Um, I think yet again, the FDA and insurance will start to dictate this shortly because I think again in July and August we will have availability of Dupixent. Um, and we expect that after that will be the omelizumab coming um, since their studies have ended um, second. Um, and it may just be that at least for these first early years of new biologics that we start with the first thing we can have available. We try it for six months. If the patient and the doctor are happy with the success, we continue it. If the patient or the doctor are unhappy with the success, we go to the next available one, which is not, frankly, an excellent way to practice medicine. But at the moment in these early, early phases of new biologics, um, we, we are going to have to be happy to take with what we can get. So the next question is, are there any markers that have been looked at to identify responders to the biologics in CRS with nasal polyps? Okay, so that is an audience plant because that's an excellent question and I'm delighted that someone cares. So the, again, very short answer is no, there hasn't been actually. Um, and this frustrates the heck out of me. However, Really, we're in a place where we now have several medications, biologics, that look as though they're working. And, what we, and they all work somewhere between 50 and 70% of the patients. What I want to know is the patient in front of me, which 50 or 70% are you in? The, the group that's going to work or the group that's not going to work? And we are just now, actually, as we speak, devising studies to compare the efficacy of one biologic to another to do those things prospectively, to keep the patients on them for three or six or 12 months, and then to go backwards at the earlier time points and say, okay, if I have a patient who at the six or the 12 month time point clearly did beautifully well on drug X, I wanna look at them before I started and at the three month change and see what happened to them and who they were, so that when I find another patient that's just like this, I know that this is the same, the right drug for them and vice versa. When we end up with a medication that just blatantly didn't work, I want to go back and say, what was it that identified this patient as not being a successful responder? Um, and there are all kinds of ways we can do that. We are looking in the blood, we're looking in biopsies of the polyp, and we're actually also looking in the fluid that comes out of your nose to help us understand what might be driving the inflammation and therefore what medications that stop inflammation might be most precisely chosen for each patient. So here's a question. Do nasal polyps ever just disappear on their own? Ah, so the textbooks will tell you no, and most patients will tell you no. But every now and then, we do have a couple of patients who, for no particularly good reason, will have at least waxing and waning. So disappear for good? No. Usually if you have them, they need to be treated or taken out. But I do have patients who will look terrible in February and for no particularly good reason come back to me in April and their polyps are smaller. And we can't always figure out what triggered them to get bigger, what triggered them to get smaller. But very rarely, if ever, do they completely go away on their own without treatment. So the next question is, how do I find out about participating in research studies for nasal polyps? Oh, that's a great question. 
So there, it depends a little bit on your area. So I would say that there, um, the, the pro, in some ways, probably most comprehensive way to do that is to go to a website called clinicaltrials.gov.gov. It is required in the United States that really all clinical trials are registered in that website. And it's relatively user-friendly, and you can kind of put into the search engine the drug that you're interested in, or nasal polyps, or CRS with NP. And up will come a list of any study currently registered in the United States that studies that. If you're looking for a medication study, you can click on them, and then usually at the bottom of that website, we'll have a list of locations. And so if there's one in a state near you, you can contact either the, um, there's either the contact person on the website or contact the person who's running the study at that site close to you. Because many of these studies are still recruiting, and there are a whole new set of medications I couldn't possibly have had time to talk about that are in phase two trials now that are desperately looking for more pa uh, patients to participate. And I'll tell you that the myth out there about getting clinical trials completed to understand which medications are best for us moving forward, the myth is that the biggest thing that gets in the way of those studies is money. It turns out, actually, the biggest thing that slows down those studies or prevents them from being successfully completed is lack of patients who are willing to participate. So in fact, the number one thing that we as a field need to help get new information out there and new medications available are patients who are willing to participate in the studies. Dr. Laidlaw, I just cannot thank you enough. This has been a great hour together. We still, I know, have a lot of questions that we weren't able to answer. Um, gosh, maybe we need to uh, do a, a, another one of these um, uh, very soon. But we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with, with us. So thank you so very much. You're welcome. At this time, please download the handouts from your control panel. If you have any difficulties, please email us using the link in your emails. We hope you join us next month for our July webinar when Dr. Bradley Chips talks with us about type 2 inflammation, severe asthma, and comorbid conditions. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for the education in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. You can also view our archived webinars on this page on our website. Visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also, access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Once again, we want to thank Dr. Laidlaw, and we want to thank each of you for joining us. Please register with us next time on advances in allergy and asthma. My name is Kara Kraft, and on behalf of the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network and Dr. Laidlaw, we hope you have a great and healthy day as we work better to breathe better together.